Hey, security peeps, we are live with another edition of Breaking Into Cybersecurity. I am Renee Small, cybersecurity super recruiter, helping amazing Whoa. leaders hire great talent. And today is a Mondays with Dan. Hi, Dan. How you doing, Renee? And hi, awesome. hi, hi to everybody on the call. It, yes. It's a, it's a wonderful Monday morning. It is an awesome Monday. Kind of chilly in the D.C. area. Yeah, it's, it's getting cold up here, too. Yep. So, Dan, today we are, goodness, seven months, six and a half months in, like way in right. <laughs> to, yeah. to these Mondays um, and excited to get started. Uh, already got somebody on, Ben. Hey, Ben. Hi, already don't here. Know. Already here. This is going to be a good one. So, Dan was sharing with me um, a story as usual. and. Um, it was around one of his clients who has 50% um, fifty percent of his deal go, go awry. So 50% of whatever situation he has going on goes awry. And so the question for today is, how does the performance of your team impact your outcome? So Dan, take it away. Here we go. So, so the question is, uh, and Renee and I have been dealing with this for a long time, how people are put in a position uh, and have a support team underneath them. They've hired people, but they really don't get a vision of how those people are operating. And in one situation, we had a case where everybody kind of just disappeared. Everybody below that was supporting these two guys who were running this organization uh, seemed to just disappear. And it was because of the performance of one person who was driving people out, people who could not work for her. And so the question is, is are you getting a 360 degree view or a thousand foot view of, uh, of your, your organization? What's working, what's not? And what was poignant about this discussion I had with somebody this morning, he said he's interviewed a whole lot of people and they say about 50% of the deals that they put together for mergers and acquisitions, but that could go across the board for anything, seem to fall apart. And we started to talk about where they fall apart. Do they fall apart at the very end? Uh, do they fall apart in, in the middle? Does it have to do with the numbers? Is it has to do with finances? What What's causing it to collapse? And in many cases, people don't realize and notice what's happening. My proposal is, is that it happens a lot sooner. And as soon as somebody comes in with a psychological intervention to say that what what does this look like? What is really going on here? It, it can be saved and captured. So if if they're losing 50%, if they only lost 30%, that would add 20% to their bottom line of, of deals that they put together. So it's how, how are you looking at the team? Now, uh, interesting story was uh, when I was doing a project with a guy in South America for Hewlett Packard, he said to me, I have a fantastic team. Uh, he said, uh, but one guy is not performing as well as he should. And we said, what's the reason? He said, I don't know. He's got all the resources he needs. Uh, uh, but what's happening is, is I'm taking all of the work that he's supposed to do and his teammates are supporting him. And I said, sounds to me like the guy needs to be fired. <laughs> and he said, oh, we can't do that. We're a country that wants to work with people and help them. Long story short, this guy had a, the, the guy who was my client was a senior executive running this whole organization, had a beautiful 360. Everybody loved him. They thought he was supportive of their work and all. And, uh, and we moved on. And what we discovered was, is that the guy who was not performing well had an unusual situation. He lived in a house owned by his father. He paid no bills. He had no expenses. He had little motivation to work for more money. And so he was not in the same category as all his teammates. And so the teammates were taking the work that this guy was not doing. And were, they were, the, the supervisor was laying it all on them. Well, after about seven months, uh, they got fed up. And when he had his next 360, they buried the guy in negative comments because 
he was not managing this one uh, underperforming person. So the underperforming person not only was destroying the morale of the group, but was destroying his ratings within the company. Mm. So, you know, what, what do you do in a situation like that? Right. That's a really, that's, that's pretty interesting that in the beginning, he was getting rave reviews on his 360. And I don't know if people realize what a 360 is, the folks that are on here. Okay, well, 360 is, is that they interview people who work around you. So they will, they will interview, uh, and there's a survey to, to fill out people who report to you, people who you report to, your clients, your colleagues, and everybody pulls together what their perception is of you. And then you get a rating, you know, a five or from one being low to a five being high. I'm, I'm curious as to if anyone on here that's watching has had a 360 done on them or have been a part of a 360. Put it in the chat if you've been a part of a 360, either for yourself or for somebody else. But go ahead, Dan. But what but what was different was that, uh, you know, I, I'd get somebody and, and then you have to rate yourself. So do you rate yourself a one or a five? Mm -hmm. So I would get this guy, for example, rated himself five, 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 five. And... I said to him, well, I said, I'm curious. How does everybody else rate you as a two and you rate yourself as a five? Where's, where's the gap? Well, I'm doing, you know, whatever his excuse was at that time. But it's the misperception of what somebody thinks they're doing and how hard they're working or what they, or are they being effective? Right. And, you know, part of the challenge of people in positions today is to, develop the people underneath them. You know, a company is expecting you to develop the people underneath you. That's how we got into the importance of looking at unconscious competence, finding out what you really, really do well and teach people how to do that. Right. You know, exactly. by cloning, really cloning yourself. So it was, it became very interesting. So a couple of people are chiming in here. Uh, Roger says, good morning. Good morning, Roger. Nora says, hi, Renee and Dan. Hope you're well and staying safe. We are. Thank you for reaching out, Nora. Danielle's here. Good morning, Danielle. She has never been a part of a 360. But you're always here, Danielle. That's great. Isn't she awesome? Okay. Uh, Maria says, I've never been a part of a 360. And Summer Rae says, I have not, but I've had many one-on-one -on -one performance meetings. So. Okay. So yeah, 360s, um, they give you a really interesting view because to Dan's point, you get a view if from um, you know, your leaders above you, your peers, if you're managing someone's people, people below you. So it's really an interesting kind of global outlook. That's why it's called 360. It's, you know, it's not just one-to-one, -one, it's not just your manager or your leader or your executive telling you what they think or your subordinates who typically <laughs> don't get to say what they want to say, right? So um, they are you know, included in it too. So you get a view of what everyone's saying. So what Dan's executive was dealing with is the people beneath him telling him in the beginning, he was great, he was getting fives. And then after the situation happened, now he's getting twos, right, Dan? Yeah, and the, fund of the fundamental issue was that he was not supporting his team. Right. He, rather than addressing the issue with his underperforming team member, yeah, he was he was uh, laying it all off on on the uh, other people in the team, and they were resentful. Yeah, I'm going to do the work of this guy, right? Particularly since he wasn't in the same category as them because they all had families and business families and expenses that he had none. Right. And that's the, that's the part. That's the component. Nora says, I think this underperformance person needs a performance management training goal set for him to achieve. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I find it, it's, for me anyway, it's more valuable to let the person set the goal for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what's, you know, if you look at 
each individual as a CEO of their own company. And you say, okay, uh, if you were running this company and you, were run and you are the CEO of your own company in reality, what are you doing to improve your company? Or what are you doing to destroy it, tear your company down? Yeah. And it's, it, it gets, but a lot of that, that comes, that was a great question because it comes back to goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, when they hire people, what do they hire them for? Do they hire them based on their skills and talents or do they hire them based on their dreams? What's your dream? Where do you want to be? Right. Tell me what you want. And that's why I take everybody. I told Renee last week, we went out to 2026. Now everybody I'm working with is in 2026. Where do you see yourself in 2026? What does that look like? And I'll look, let's look backwards from there to today to anything that could foul that up. Yep. And totally. so, and that's helping people, uh, helping people understand that. Yeah. But it, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I had a client who was a, a litigation firm in New York City. Mm -hmm. And the partners, one of the partners said to me, I really hate to do annual reviews of people's performance. And I said, okay, um, what, uh, what's the issue? She said, well, you know, I have to ask them all these questions. I said, why don't you let them review themselves? Yeah. They said, what do you mean? I said, tell them to come in and tell you the top three things that they did this year, what went into it, how it went, what are their projections for next year? What do you, if there were some things that didn't work well, what would they do differently? How would they do it differently? And so really it puts people in a position of like the guy who puts the five down for himself and everybody else puts it too. <laughs> you know? But really you need some self-reflection. Sure. Rather than keep the pressure on yourself, why don't you put the pressure on a person who's going to be who you're reviewing? Let them tell you what they do well. Right. So Roger White says, I just had one. It is it is an experience. Um, I'm just curious about what kind of feedback, you know, who, who fed back yeah. all the results here? Was it part of an overall program? Uh, I'd be curious too part of personal development, because what we would do is we would take the 360 for the individual with HP, we pair it up with the Hogan risk assessment, which would show a person every single place they could foul up going forward. I use that with my clients all the time. Mm -hmm. Because it's important to know if you're going into a situation, what you could do that would derail you, that's invisible to you. A lot of this stuff that derails people, they're not aware of. It's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. They have no clue. That's why yeah. it's, it's pretty, um, that whole Hogan assessment and everything is really, really interesting. Samurai says what I found interesting in my experience is my employees had a much different outlook than my supervisors. Well, that I, that would pose a bunch of questions for me. First of all, what was I don't know what the relationship is between you and your supervisors, but what, you know, what do they have, you know, do you, do, do you intimidate them? Do they feel like you're in a position to take their position? Were they positive or not positive? I know I had a situation with somebody who, who uh, posted for a job and uh, the supervisor posted for the job the same day and wrote, wrote a negative review. And so and the person was very upset with the negative review. I said, read me the review. So when she read the review, it was every reason the other people wanted her was what the person put. I said, this is like a recommendation. <laughs> you know, what, and, and, you know, it, I think it's important, particularly in people in leadership roles, is to get a thousand foot view, get up over everything and look down on it and say, what's going on here? Yeah. You know, what's really happening? And it's usually what I find is that the stuff early on in a, in a deal or a negotiation is where things tend to go south because people don't look at the um, they don't look at the psychological aspects of what's playing out. Yeah. Well, Dan, some of the things. Well, before I, you know, I just want to shout out a couple more people here um, who said good morning. Where did it go? Just went away somewhere. Okay, Clarence is here. He said good morning and supper. So all of our favorite people are here. 
Sansere, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, says you're hitting the nail on the head with this one. Thank you. <laughs> so. But you know what's important is it's, I had just had a discussion with a guy about my concept of selling mistakes. He said, why do you say problems? I said, well, because people don't want to make mistakes. And so if you can identify a mistake really early on or project the possibility of a mistake in a situation, then you don't have to go back and correct what's happened. You know, people will say, why would anybody want to buy a mistake? And mm -hmm. I said, well, they don't want to make them themselves and it's a lot cheaper to, uh, to, to learn by somebody else's mistakes to learn by your own. Right. People, oh, I learned by my mistakes. Yeah, I said, but what if you don't have to? What if you can learn by somebody else's? Of course, a lot, exactly. a lot less effort. But you know, it was I was relating a situation to him this morning about it was an international company with products that were manufactured in Japan. It was a family business, and the current CEO, uh, the person I was working with here in the states, who was CEO for for United States, he said. Uh, Look, he said, uh, you know, the guy who is running the company, the, his father gave him the company. And I said, uh, no, I said, his father didn't give him the company. His father's still running a company in the background. It just looks like he gave him the company. So I asked a couple of questions and I said, what, what was happening there? And he said, well, he said, you know, uh, he said, the father's divorced from the CEO's mother. The father has a trophy wife who's got a kid and she is promoting the kid to take over the biological son's position in the company. Wow. So it's like, how do you deal with that? You have to, you have to go into the deal, understanding all the dynamics that are going on when you're negotiating with somebody. So the current CEO has got, you got to make them look really good. You have to understand what's going on, understand the pressure that the guy is under. And, you know, in some way, pick sides. Who are you going to help out here? So, but again, it played into the negotiation and the pricing structures and everything they did. But when this team, before this team went overseas, we worked with the team on strategies they would have with each individual person they were going to deal with. What to say, how to interact how to persuade somebody. And so it was really quite interesting and dynamic when you saw it, and it, and it, and it really worked out well. Mm -hmm. Without knowing all these dynamics, without asking the right questions at the right time and the right people, they would have walked in to a buzzsaw. Yeah. And I don't think people fully understand, especially the, the type of work that you do and the type of when you talk about profiling people and just understanding the whole landscape um, and situations like that. Like if you don't, how would, who would even know that this is what's going on? Who would anybody even dig to find out that this person has, you know, the trophy wipe, like all of these pieces to the puzzle um, so that you know what's happening behind the scenes. Like most people would just think this is what, you know, this is what's happening. They only see the surface stuff or whatever someone is saying, you know, without being questioned or without being uncovered, finding out what's happening. I, I had a guy call me and say he wanted me to help him with an insurance proposal, a huge insurance proposal that he had. And so I worked with him on it. He gave the proposal to the company. He said, the guy I'm speaking to is going to make a decision. Uh, and uh, we, we, it was really, he said, you were fan he said, he said to me, you were fantastic. I said, okay. So we wait about a week, and then he gets a call back from the guy he spoke to. And the guy says, well, I have to take your proposal now to somebody higher in the company. He said, I thought he was a decision maker. Well, we had made that mistake. He wasn't a decision maker. Mm -hmm. So I said, are you going to let him give this proposal to move it up within the company, or are you going to go and help him do it? He said, what do you think? I said, I think you should help him do it, because otherwise, how can he explain everything that you know innately? So he did that and he said, that went well. And he said, now we find out that he's got to take this out to Pittsburgh to, uh, to have somebody else review it. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I said, why don't you call the CEO out there and find out 
if this proposal fits his budget and the way he wants to operate the business, uh, would he have any problem changing or firing the current insurance company? He says, no, he says, I hate the guy. He said, <laughs> he said boy, he said, I, w I was so satisfied that I had gotten a deal. And then I said to him, he said, but it didn't, it didn't work out. I said, why not? He said, I didn't ask one question. Who was the current insurance broker? It was his son-in-law or the owner. They were never, ever kind of let their change the insurance from their family member. So it's getting a thousand foot view of these situations and really saying, what do we need to do here? Yeah. Roger said this a little sooner, but I think it's it's uh it's perfect now too. Great insight. I'm gonna use I'm gonna use that. I think it I think it had to do with the um not the 360, the thousand foot view. I think that's around the time he made this comment. Roger, thousand foot view and asking the right questions. You know, people, it is astounding how often people ask the wrong questions to the wrong people. They ask people who have no training to help them, no interest in helping them, maybe even have another agenda. And they ask the wrong questions. I have a, a client who's a, uh, 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 what what kind of law he he does patent he's a patent attorney and i said to him what some of the mistakes people make he says they tell everybody about their fabulous new idea and somebody steals it <laughs> oh i said you should have a t-shirt that says don't talk to anybody you know because if you have an idea you have to decide who you're going to give it to or talk yeah. to them about it. so it's it's wild though yeah Nora says, people need to enjoy the fruit of their labor and they need to reap what they sow. The biological son must be the one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's, important, it's important for him to know that there was, there was competition in the mix. You know, and yeah, where it was coming from. Who would have even known any of that? I mean, yeah. some of the scenarios that you and I have worked on, it's like, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> who knows that all of this stuff is happening, you know? Somebody sleeping with somebody, you know. Well, like. it would always, when, Renee, when Renee would present me with a situation within the company, <laughs> I'd say to her, the first thing we have to figure out is who's sleeping with who. <laughs> it's true. I mean, there's so much. There's and that, so was, many be, things that was before the woke era. Right. That's pre-woke. <laughs> pre-woke. Pre-woke questions. But again, you know. But, but the question I come back to is, what does it cost somebody not to take the time to ask the question? Sansa Ray said, you're hitting the nail on the head. Sansa Ray has been <laughs> in these situations. She knows. <laughs> sure. So, you know, but, but the important thing is to be asking the questions. And that's why I say to people, you know, people, people will say, <laughs> Renee Lothis, they say, when should I call you? I said, this is easy. Maybe some of you have heard it before. But what I tell people is imagine a big fan packed with wet manure and a guy with a plug by an outlet. You call me before he puts the plug in the wall. Because, you you, you know, it's, it's so it, it's so much less expensive to catch a mistake before it's made. Right. Yeah. And then they ask who is married to who. Yeah, yes. Who's married to who. Exactly. Whose contract is connected to who? Who's getting deals under the table and above the table? What's going on? You know, there's so much stuff going on. It is, but but the thing is, is what's important is that people are looking at it and assessing it and asking the questions. That's the value of the uh, um, profiles that I use with people. Mm -hmm. What? Who is this person? How long have they been in their position? Where do they want to be? Are they moving up? Is there somebody mentoring them to move them up? Are they in a the right position? Uh, what do they need to have happen to get them where they want to get to? How do you do that? It yeah. can't, it's a, so it's going in with a, a fraction of the information you need to persuade them. You, you look at a board of directors. If anybody here has to present to a board or present to a, a committee, well, who's on the committee? 
how do you need to present stuff in a way that people will say, you know, uh, I really need to talk about this. Yeah. I, I don't want I don't want to be asking the wrong questions of the wrong people. Nora's into that story. She said the trophy mom had a hidden agenda before entering into that marriage. The trophy's child needs to go and inherit the biological father's inheritance. Yes. A whole lot going on. There you go. Yep. Yeah. That's the agenda. But what you just put in that, that commentary is going to guide the way you interact with those people. Correct. It's, you know, it's, so, it's, and it's, it's knowing that it's happening is what's important. You so know, imagine it, if, and Dan, I know you usually say this all the time, but imagine if you didn't know. Imagine if the person who doesn't know that all of this is happening. So they're right. just marching along, you know, not even understanding any of this. Right. How blindsided would they be when they find out how, you know, like, it's just a whole different world going on. Sure. In parallel that you don't even know about. And, and a lot of it because people don't look at it. People don't ask the questions. And that's that's what's what 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 are the right questions to be asked? You know, people say everybody wants great answers. Well, to get great answers, you have to ask fantastic questions to the right people. Right. And be sure you don't ask the, the a great question to the wrong person, because knowing who they are. But you know, the interesting thing about all this, Renee, and we've discovered this over years, is that you read energy. Everybody on this call reads energy. And you get a knot in the pit of your stomach when something's going on or when you see something, you go, what the hell is this about? And then all of a sudden, you get you you have to pay attention. You have to honor your intuition. If there's something in your mind that says, there's something not right here. It's probably not right. And then the question is, how do you deal with it to protect yourself, right. or your team? You know, I... I, I worked with a guy who ran finance for the United States for Hewlett Packard. And he said to me, I had to go out and present uh, a deck of slides to the executive board. He said, I went out, I put the deck of slides in and, and everything. He said, and they were wrong. And they were misordered. And he said, it was, it, was, it was embarrassing. He said to me, I want to come back and kill the guy who put this together. I said, no, don't do that. I said, ask them to produce the next set of slides and just bring them into you before your next presentation. And when he does that, say, you know, my reputation is about developing people underneath me. <laughs> and the way I do that is I give people an opportunity to present to the board of directors. He said, so I'm going to ask you to present this deck that you just gave me to the board the next in the next couple of weeks. He said, the guy reached across the desk and he grabbed the deck. He said, I'll be back. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. So Sansa Ray wants to know, most of the time people don't know about this. The question is, how do you deal with it and what can one do? Great question. I believe very strongly in a coaching culture. Everybody wants to talk about how to be managers and management culture. I've got a, a, a program that talks about the instituting a coaching culture. So here's how the coaching culture works. I come to work for Renee under the particular management structure. And she says to me, here's what I want you to do. And I'll evaluate you on what you do. And I'm going to tell you what to do and away you go. Okay. So if you have one of Renee, that's fine. But if you have 10, or if you, as you and Packard did, had remote management issues, how do you manage a remote team? Well, the only way I think you can do it is with a coaching culture. And here's how the coaching culture sounds. I come to Renee and Renee says to me, I have a project. I want you to take a look at it, go home and come back tomorrow and tell me how you're going to do this. And then she has to be quiet and let me explain what my process is going to be. And she will know very quickly whether I align with the thought process or not. So that's the first part. 
So one thing has been established. She agrees with the way I'm going to promote this going forward. Plus, I have had to do all the work. I'm not coming there and telling me, tell me what to do. I'm using my experience to research it. That's number one. The second part of this coaching process is you have to say, now we have a time frame. We need this done by March 15th. Do you see anything in your future that would prevent you from having this done by March 15th? And I would say, no, I don't have any place to go. I'm not, well, right now we're not going anywhere. But the thing is, it's March 15th. So two things have happened. I've, um, I agreed, we, Renee and I have agree on a process and what we're going to do. We also agree on a time frame. And the third question is, is, she would say to me, Dan, what do you need from me? Do you need money? Do you need resources? Do you need help? What do you need? What do you need? So now if she's just managing me or coaching me, then when she comes in, she'll say to me, Dan, what? She can see every morning she could say, rather than say to me, are you doing what you said you would do? Are you up to date with everything? All she has to do is say, Dan, do you need anything from me? Do you need anything from me? Do you need anything from me? Now, imagine this. If you're sitting in uh, Singapore and you have somebody in, in California and somebody in France and somebody in Germany on, on a remote team, that's the only way you can do this. But it's a very comfortable way to find out as everybody's on top of it. And so... It, it, and then what happens is this thought process trickles down within your organization. So you really are teaching people underneath you how to coach the other people. The biggest factor in the coaching complex is what we talked about a couple of weeks ago is unconscious competence. For a person to be able to effectively use this, they have to know what they do well. And that's a challenge sometimes. Some people do stuff automatically and they don't know how they do it. They just get great results. But this is a system that you can yeah. roll out. We've rolled this out with a whole wide variety of companies. Right. Yeah, Dan. Um, I've seen you in action multiple times. <laughs> Uh, rolling things like this out and having, you know, coaching people into the coaching culture. And it's, uh, you know, it's a sight to see because then it's on the person to you take the pressure to your point earlier, you're taking the pressure off yourself. You know, that guy with the presentation deck with the sloppy presentation deck. It's like, hey, I'm going to coach you. And you don't have to say anything because... Oh. Now he's off making sure it's polished yeah, and perfect. Exactly. He has to present it. It's the question is, who don't you want to be? Right. You don't want to be the guy standing in front of the board of directors with lousy slides. And so it's, it's, it's just a different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so the, I'm wondering what kind of management challenges that people have on this call? What is this types of stuff in? What's going on? What do you need to have happen right now that's not happening? That's our question. Yeah. Dan's, Dan's number one question. What do you need to have happen right now that's not happening? <laughs> right. So Sans Sansare says, thank you, Dan, for that explanation, what a person can do. So yeah, Dan, after you, you know, typically when you're working with these executives and, and, and individuals too, because, you know, people need to realize that if they haven't been here for the last six, seven months, <laughs> you work with not only CEOs and C-suite executives, but also student athletes, professional athletes, individuals, you know, people across the board and organizations um, and outside organizations to help. There, there's that call. There's your call, Renee. My call, right before twelve noon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so people should realize that you know you work with you have programs for leaders and individuals and you know people who are have their own companies and don't. So it's not just 
you know, it's not just a C-suite. It's all different levels. Yeah. It's pe people who want to want to get better at what they do, but want to do it fast. This is not therapy. It's it's a unique strategy that works for people, and uh, and helps them to think differently. I mean, how we had a topic a couple of weeks ago about how how do I make myself invaluable to the people who are trying to hire me? Mm -hmm. You know, understanding that most most CEOs of companies sometimes don't know they're at risk. They don't know where the risks are coming from. Right. They don't know how to evaluate what you do because what you do is largely invisible, I think, as is what I do. Right. And so, you know, uh, and I've seen people make decisions. I had a, a guy who came to me for business negotiation strategies who said he had some challenges playing golf 50 yards in. What ultimately came out is the only time he had problem 50 yards in is when he played against somebody who made more money than he did. And here's a guy who makes high seven figures. He wouldn't think that he'd be intimidated by somebody who's wealthier than he is, but he was. Right. What gets in people's... Roger said, that's the number one question. What right. needs to happen right now that's not happening? Right. And so, and you know, that relies on people to say, here is what I want to have happen. Well, a lot of people, when I ask that question, don't know this. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I want. I don't. I really don't know what I want to have happen. So somebody will say, "Give me an example." What do you? Want? They don't. They don't answer. Yeah. But understanding, helping somebody understand the value of knowing where you want to be. But taking them psychologically out to the place they want to be and say, let's find anything that will derail this. Mm -hmm. This was the key to senior executives in HP at the merger of Compaq, going out meeting with CEOs of other companies and saying to them, take me out five years. Tell me where you see. They said, no, no, I want to talk to you about today. And the guy would say, well, he said, why do you want to know about five years from now? He said, because we want to produce products that are going to help you, whatever your challenge is going to be five years from now. What do you think the challenges are going to be? Right. They weren't thinking about that. They certainly were spurred to think about it after he asked the question. Yeah. I was doing some research earlier today about around career outlooks. And... Um, it's interesting because especially around now when you when you have all of, all of your clients in 2026 it was it was interesting it was it was interesting to see what different careers are you know going to expand in the next 5 or 10 years um, and looking at that right so looking forward and seeing sure. this is what the market is going to look like this is what's going to be in demand um, and just always doing that forward, you know, being in, you know, because I've been connected to you for so many years, I'm <laughs> always five years, <laughs> always in the future. So, so looking at that this morning really made me think, oh, these are, you know, these are some of the, uh, some of the roles that are going to be in what, what's happening, what's coming, what's forthcoming, how far out, you know, 10 years out, types of opportunities that are going to be out here. And what and, and reality is, what do they want to be doing? Yep. Exactly. So you want to be in a place of growth for sure. But Dan, we're at the we're almost at the top of the hour, and um, okay. we got to wrap. So just wanted to thank you again as we go into. Hmm? I said you're welcome. As we go into Thanksgiving, thank everyone and let everyone know. I mean, I'll be back again, but I know you. We'll be here next Monday, right. Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday. <laughs> Cyber Monday. But wanted to thank you for all that you've been doing for this You're community welcome. for You're the welcome. last, gosh, since March. Before. So, since before the pandemic even started. Um, right. But consistently since, we, since, you know, we've all been on and off lockdown, depending on where you are. Right. Um, so I'm definitely grateful for you, Dan. Thanks a lot. You too, Ray. Look forward to uh, connecting again next week. Good. Okay. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.